All right, internet. Um, this week's gonna be a good one. I'm uh, quite excited about this week. So uh, this week we finished a book called Applied Network Security Monitoring. And if you follow this, which I'm sure you don't, um, uh, the previous week or the week before that, I finished a book called The Practice of Network Security Monitoring. And um, that one was more of an introductory book to the theory. And this one is a, li a little bit longer and a lot more in depth. So they talk a lot more about the details and they talk about different types of software and all that stuff. So it's, it's a, lot more, uh, a lot more useful actually um, than in comparison to the other one, honestly, the way that I felt about it. And this book for me was actually the book that I've been seeking for a while because when, when learning about cybersecurity, um, like my, I'm sure many people like myself get quite overwhelmed. And we get overwhelmed due to the fact that it's, it's chaotic because you listen to all these talks, you read these books, these lectures, you listen to podcasts. Everyone's talking about different things. Um, so they might be talking about a technology, they might be talking about a process, or some sort of like fundamental technology uh, in relation to whatever they're doing instead of just some sort of software or tool. When talking about all these different areas, they're all chaotic and disparate and separate. And there is no kind of uh, common string or pattern or structure associated to walking you through where it's relevant, how it's relevant and all that stuff. People just talk about maybe hacks or attacks or different ways to protect the network in certain situations. Um, and I, I came across this book and this book actually for me provided a lot of structure from the perspective of a security analyst that's monitoring a network. So I thought it was pretty amazing and it's probably one of the best that I've come across in this specific niche. So uh, today we're talking about two things. We're gonna talk a bit about both quite, quite a bit. I didn't wanna talk about everything because like I said, this book is pretty big. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, in the post, there's a lot more detail than I'll discuss here. So if you're interested, you should go to that. But yeah, let's, uh, let's dive in to structuring chaos. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is intelligence, right? And uh, before I jump into this, when, when you talk about intelligence in the cybersecurity industry, most people default to threat intelligence. But there's actually friendly intelligence as well. So it's not just external things trying to get in, but it's internal stuff that's happening in your network. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about here in the Intel piece because that's, um, that's what the, the author kind of hits on in this book where he talks about how a lot of companies focus on the uh, threat but they don't focus on the friends. So the friends being the devices on your network and not only devices on your network but they also focus on the connections between the devices um, within this network and the historical connections they've had externally. Um, so, you know, be friendly with your network before you do intelligence. So the next piece is I'm going to talk about, let me go back. So the next piece I want to talk about in this book, he talks uh, about the H&P process for um, basically mapping your network. And H&P stands for historical and physical. And he pulled this analogy from the medical field. So when you walk into a doctor's office, usually the, when, the, when the doctor examines you, the first two things they do is they, they check your physical status. So like they check your breathing and your heart and your joints and all that stuff. And then also they check your... Um, your previous history on medication and the issues you've had. So they look at the historical perspective of your of your situation. And the same thing can apply for a network when you're mapping it for your friendly intelligence because like I said, friendly intelligence is probably the most important and um, least uh, looked at and admired and not admired but used uh, piece of the, the network when you're going about this intelligence process. The h &P process mapped over to the cybersecurity world is basically looking at the physical piece. So you want to see all the physical devices on your network. You want to see what kind of devices they are and you want to see their IP addresses or their, their DNS names. You want to see which VLAN they're, VLAN they're located on. You want to see all these other things. And one way to do this is using a tool called Nmap, which I won't talk about now, but it's a useful tool to do that. And you can basically run Nmap on your internal network and you can see all the different devices, all the ports being used, all the ports that are open, etc. with that. Another tool I mentioned here is called PRADS, P-R-A-D-S. And it stands for Passive Real-Time Asset Detection Systems. And this was the tool that he mentioned would be useful for looking at the historical perspective of your network because you're not just looking at the devices, that's the physical side. The historical side for cybersecurity in this context is figuring out the historical connections that have been associated to the device that you're using. 
And once you switch on this Prad software and you have it running for a while, you can actually reflect historically on the connections that, are, that have been associated to the device and you can kind of create a baseline of what's normal. So what connection should this device have? What kind of connections have it ha has it had in the past and what has changed in the future? So it's kind of a way to keep kind of a, a heartbeat on the network over time and you have a perspective on what's normal in your network and if something weird happens, then you know, that, you know this, is, this is something bad. So yeah, this is, um, this is pretty important and it seems as if it's missed in a lot of the lectures and things I've talked about. So friendly intelligence is just as important as threat intelligence, if not more. So another thing he talks about in the Intel piece is open source intelligence. And in cybersecurity, I think this is an acronym called like OSINT or something like that. And uh, open source intelligence is basically a bunch of websites and publicly uh, publicly maintained uh, different types of lists for hashes and file names and, and websites and IP addresses and all that stuff. And you can actually use these websites to um, check and see if something on your network is malicious. And I'll run through a few of these ex examples he gave in the book. So one is Robtex, which is um, where you basically, you can do like an IP lookup where you send it, you, where you publish an IP address in the search engine on this website and it comes back and it tells you basically a whole bunch of information associated to this IP address saying who owns it, what's the domain names associated to it and all these other things um, related to that IP. That's one. And another one is uh, IP void and URL void. And these are basically two blacklists. So if there's an IP address in your network and you first off want to see who owns it or you want to see what's associated with it, you can look it up in rope text. And then the next step is say, okay, well, is this IP address uh, malicious or something wrong with it? So you can go to IP void and you can look up the IP address there and it'll show you if this IP address has been blacklisted anywhere else. So basically this website curates a whole bunch of blacklists into a single search engine. And the same thing for URL void. So if there's a URL that a, um, a user has uh, went to, so some sort of website, you can actually put that website into the URL void and they can tell you if this domain name has been associated to some sort of blacklist somewhere else because it's the same thing, it curates a bunch of blacklists into a search engine for that. So those are two pieces there for the open source intelligence. Another one is VirusTotal, which is, uh, is probably one of my favorite because it's, it's designed so well and it has, I think it's like 70 plus antivirus engines curated um, into this single source. So you can basically, you can publish a URL, you can put an IP address in there, you can upload a file, you can upload a file hash, you can, you can upload all kinds of stuff into this website and basically what it does is it takes that and it checks it against all these different antivirus engines and says if this is on those or not. And if it is, then it might be more, might be malicious depending on how many there is. So that's a pretty good one, you should check that out. And uh, the last one is a uh, Cuckoo Sandbox. So Cuckoo Sandbox is basically a uh, reverse engineering malware um, sandbox basically. So it's a, it's a virtual machine where say you, you have a piece of malware on your network and you wanna see what it does, how, how, it, like, how it works and how it unfolds without impacting anything on your network. Well you can take that malware and you can upload it to the sandbox and what the sandbox does is actually, it's, it's, I think it's like a, it's called automatic malware analysis or something. And it takes a bunch of screenshots, sends you, sends you a bunch of feeds and logs and stuff associated to what this malware is doing as it's happening. So it tells you what it accesses, what it executes, um, what it creates, what it, what it takes away, all that stuff. So it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. One thing I do want to mention that, that is pretty important with all this stuff is if there is an attacker on your network and this attacker is semi-intelligent, um, they may have some sort of script created uh, that's basically checking these websites constantly, seeing if their malware or their specific attack has been published on these. And once they see that that's been published, they know that their attack is no longer useful, so they'll have to pivot and uh, kind of manipulate their attack in a way that it's uh, they can still get access to your network. So anytime you publish any of this stuff uh, publicly on an open source intelligence website, you have to keep that in mind understanding the fact that there's a chance that the attacker might see this. Now onto the analysis piece. So this was probably hands down my favorite chapter of this book, maybe my favorite chapter of any cybersecurity book I've read. And the reason being is it goes back to the beginning point I made in this presentation is the fact that when jumping into the cybersecurity world, you um, get overwhelmed quickly because of the chaos and there's no structure. Well, in this chapter, this author basically strings together all the different types of, all the software, all the processes and everything listed out in this book into uh, two, two scenarios and two basically methods of approach when you're analyzing or investigating an event on your network. 
And as an analyst, um, many analysts have their own ways of going about investigating a security event on the network because they've, uh, they've learned different ways through different people and their experience. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of standard method of approaching and analyzing an investigation on a network. And that, that, that's good for some people, but for most newcomers, it's hard. It's, it's hard because the learning curve is very steep and you have to basically mimic what other people are doing around you and there's no standard kind of process saying like do this, 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 and this. And the methods he provides in this book aren't necessarily like step-by-step -step processes, but it's somewhat of a framework that you can use to guide you along the investigation without being completely lost. So I really appreciated that. And the two that he provided in this chapter uh, were called relational differ differential. And the first one, relational, is uh, my favorite and the one I'll walk you through in a, uh, a real world scenario here so you can kind of get an idea. So the relational piece is uh, like police officers. So when a police officer arrives at a scene and they're looking at uh, an investigation, they, they, do, they go through a, step, a, a series of processes to make sure that they're doing it the right way and they're investigating in the correct manner. And I'll talk more about the details in a second. And the, the, infantry, the, this, the other one that I can't pronounce um, is basically a, a doctor's method of doing a, um, a, a diagnosis on a patient. So when they're sick, they, they basically, what happens is they look at the patient and they say, okay, so uh, tell me all your symptoms. So they list out all the symptoms that are happening. And then from that, they'll have the, the doctor will have hopefully a good intuition from their previous experience saying, okay, well, based off of these symptoms, the most likely scenario of this diagnosis is X. Like you're most, li most likely having this issue and this is the diagnosis. And after that step, what they'll do is they'll actually create a list of diagnoses um, associated to these symptoms. And then what they'll do from there is they'll actually prioritize this list of uh, different things that they should do about the si situation based on severity, what's most important. And then they'll eliminate those all the way down to the point where they've found the one that's uh, the most likely based off of evidence and data they've researched. So this approach, which is in more detail in the book, is from my, from my opinion, from my perspective of reading this, it seems like it's uh, useful for someone that's um, more adept in security and uh, security analyzing investigation security stuff. And the reason I say that, <laughs> that makes no sense what I just said. Words are hard. Um, anyways, so the, the doctor piece I'm mentioning here is th the point I'm getting across is that individuals that have experience are better off using this method because they have a better intuition when they can look at a problem and say, most likely this is the issue. When you're a newcomer, your intuition is you know, zero, zilch, there's nothing there. And the reason being is you don't have anything to refer to in your brain. So that's why I think relational is actually more, um, more useful for someone like myself and newcomers. So relational, what is it? So it's, he breaks it down in four steps, but these steps can continue you know, indefinitely until you solve, this, solve the issue. So the first step, we'll look at the middle column here. So the first step is basically you're gonna figure out who your primary subjects are all, primary subjects involved are. And these primary subjects are going to be the devices. So the devices that are talking to each other in, in this attack or in this security event, those are your primary subjects. So you basically map all those out. Next, you wanna figure out the primary relationships between these subjects. So all these different devices that are talking in the security event, you wanna figure out what the connections are between those, how they're talking, what they're talking about, and all that stuff. And then next, while you're doing that investigation, you actually might come across a secondary subject, which isn't necessarily directly correlated to the event, but they're, they're kind of on the outskirts of it. So then you'll examine those. And after you examine those, and you'll examine the relationships between the secondary subjects and either the primary subjects or um, other subjects around them. So you can see that you're basically, you're examining the uh, subjects, then the relationships, subjects, relationships, subjects, relationships, over and over and over and over and over until you figure out kind of the end solution or solve for this event. And so what I wanted to do is actually, I wanted to walk you through a real life scenario, which I thought was super, super useful for me when I was reading the book and really made it click. And hopefully I'll do that for you as well. So in this, uh, here we go. So it, it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go from start to finish for a relational analysis, like the police officer one I mentioned to you. And so let's imagine you're starting your uh, first day at, uh, I don't know, some sort of company, and you're working as a um, security analyst, right? And uh, let's say it's at the end of your first day, it's 4.30 p.m. and you're about to walk out of the office or log off from home because you're working remotely. and I've broken this out in uh, four phases. So you can see at the bottom, we're going through these different phases one at a time. And the one that's blue is the one that we're in and the other ones are ones we're getting to. 
So you're about to log off and you receive this alert on your SIM. So the dashboard you're looking at it says ET web client PDF with embedded file. And you're like, oh shit, there's some stuff going down. We should probably check this out. So you're looking at the alert and you're kind of reading through the details in the SIM. So there's quite a bit of information inside of this dashboard that you're looking at. So you're reading through the dashboard, looking at this alert and trying to examine, is this something that I should focus on or is this a false positive or is this not something that's too big? So you're looking through it and as you're looking through it, then you realize that there are two devices involved. So we have our devil external hostile device, which is 192025. And then we have our internal angel device, um, which is the one that we're protecting. This is our friendly device. And we have, that's a 172161620. So these are two devices that are talking in this event. And you see when you're looking through this, when you're skimming through the dashboard, you realize that a PDF has been downloaded um, from this hostile device onto our internal uh, you know, angel device. So after examining this, you're like, okay, well, maybe I should, maybe I should look at this a little more seriously. So now it's time to actually um, start kind of the process of kind of examining your primary subjects, right? So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to see that they're talking. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to get Wireshark, right? So we're going to take Wireshark and we're going to basically uh, pull that packet uh, from that, from that uh, communication that we've seen from the alert. And once you've extracted that PDF, um, we're going uh, we're gonna to kind of look at this PDF and see what's inside of it and see what's kind of being exchanged. And another thing that we're actually going to do is we're going to take a hash of this PDF file that we've extracted and then we're going to publish it on the virus total and say, okay, well, has this been, uh, has this been seen anywhere else? Is it malicious? And as we post it there, we see that 23% of the antivirus engines uh, stated that this is malicious. Once we see that, we're like, okay, well, maybe this is something serious and maybe this is something we should look into. After we've realized that, now it's time to um, map the network. So now it's time to look at the network and not just map the network, but map these devices. We wanna see as much, we wanna learn as much as we can about these subjects, these two devices. So first we'll start with the internal device and we'll look at all the things we can find out about this device. And to do so, we'll use Nmap and uh, Prads like I mentioned last time. So for Nmap, we'll look at basically the operating system of this device. We'll see that it's a Windows 7 device and we'll, we'll, find, we'll find out some other information about this device as we're doing an Nmap scam on that IP address. Next, we'll look at the, uh, the Prads bit and we'll see the types of communications that this device has had and to see if it's, t if it's talked to any other devices and all that stuff. And luckily it's not, it's not talked to too many other devices internally. So uh, right now it seems like it's a secluded issue on this one device. So next we'll actually take this IP address and we'll go to the open source intelligence uh, websites I mentioned and we'll take both the domain name, the IP address and we'll look at the NetFlow data as well. So for the domain name, or so the IP address will submit, right? So we submit the IP address and we realize there is no matches, so that's a good sign. But then we submit the domain name and we see that there are three matches, so three blacklists have associated this domain as a bad thing. So we're like, okay, well, crap, this domain's not good that this internal uh, website visited. And then we also look at the NetFlow data. So we're examining the NetFlow data, which is just a form of data. So we have uh, full PCAP data and then we have uh, NetFlow data and then a variety of like session data and things like that. But NetFlow basically shows you the communications of this, of this uh, IP address to our internal um, network. And luckily we can see that this has only been communicating to this device. So that's another good sign that um, it's only communicating to this one and no one else. So next, we've uh, we figured out the subjects, so we've examined them. Now we're going to figure out more about the relationship between these two subjects. And in this book, he mentions this thing called the rules of ten and uh, rule of tens. And he mentions this uh, idea because a lot of issues happen with uh, new analysts where they maybe uh, extract too much data for an investigation or they don't extract enough data for an investigation. And here with the rules of 10, you basically take 10 minutes previously, historical, to, you know, the historical 10 minutes and the future 10 minutes associated to the event that's here. So 10 and 10 back and front. And you can do that with Wireshark. So you extract this uh, traffic data and you start examining it and you start going through these, uh, this data with Wireshark. And what you notice when you're looking through um, the Wireshark, when you're looking through this data, is you realize that um, this internal address was actually visiting a legitimate website that wasn't, uh, wasn't evil, and wasn't a devil, like that little guy there. And um, on that website, there was actually an advertisement that popped up. And the advertisement that popped up, the internal uh, IP address clicked on the advertisement, and that advertisement actually uh, diverted that internal address to another website, and that other website was their evil website. And once they got diverted to this website, that PDF was downloaded. 
And this is uh, considered as a drive-by download. So this has happened, right? So we've, we've gone to the good website, got the advertisement, and it shot us off to the bad website. So next, what we're gonna do is we're going to take this uh, PDF that's been downloaded, and we're gonna actually submit it to the sandbox I mentioned earlier, which is Cuckoo's Egg. So we're gonna submit this, um, submit it to the anti-malware, or the, the malware automatic uh, analysis thing, and it's gonna start analyzing this PDF. And as it's going through this PDF, we're gonna realize that there's actually a hard-coded IP address in the PDF that's a new uh, evil address. So now we have two evil addresses, right? So we have our primary subject, and our uh, primary friendly device. So we have our primary subjects and then we have a secondary evil subject that just appeared as we were doing this automatic analysis of the malware and uh, the sandbox. So with that being said, that means we're moving on to the next phase. So we're now we're moving on to our secondary subjects. So we're looking through our secondary subjects now. So now we have this, uh, the secondary subject that was hard coded into the PDF as we mentioned earlier. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, uh, we're gonna learn more about the subject, remember? So we start with the subjects, and we gotta learn more about them. So we're gonna learn more about the subject first before we talk about the relationships. So we're gonna look at this IP address and we're gonna throw it up in IP void and see if there's any blacklists. And when we do that, we realize this IP address has been blacklisted maybe three or four times. Then we wanna look at the NetFlow data and we wanna see this NetFlow data and say, okay, well with this NetFlow data, which IP addresses is this bad IP address connecting to and talking with? And when doing so, we actually realize that this, this new secondary bad IP address is actually speaking to our primary address as well. So we have the secondary talking to primary, but as we're looking through the NetFlow data, we realize, oh crap, there's not just this primary address, but now we have two secondary uh, friendly addresses in addition to the primary. So now we have three friendly and then two, uh, two hostile. So the additional two, uh, the two secondary uh, friendly addresses are here. You can see it's 0.30 and 0.40. And they're all talking to this address. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the relationship piece. Now, now, we, now we understand our subject. We know who they're talking to now. So we need to figure out what they're talking about to these friendly addresses. So when we start examining this, we go back to the Wireshark situation. And we pull out the data. Remember rules of 10. And then when we're looking through this rules of 10 and we're looking through this data, we realize that they're all communicating over port 80. But when you're looking at the protocol in port 80, you realize that the protocol they're using um, isn't H HTTP, which usually is expected for port 80. It's a custom protocol that they've created. Um, and in this custom pro protocol, this evil address is basically getting these other uh, friendly addresses to send um, system information. But in addition to sending system information, this, uh, this evil address can actually command and control these devices to both send data as well. So this scenario that we've, we've found ourselves in back when we started out our day, or we were ending our day, we thought it was just a silly kind of a small alert, not a big deal, but now we've gotten to a point where we realize that there's an evil address that has a command and control, uh, has command and control over our friendly addresses, which is you know not a great thing. And uh, that's it. So um, this was uh, quite a long presentation, longer than usual, but I really thought that uh, this analysis piece and walking you through the scenario was quite important. Um, it's, it really resonated with me. It totally made sense after reading through it and kind of referencing a lot of the research. So I hope that it was useful for you and that you can maybe add some structure to the chaos that is learning cybersecurity. And it's not as overwhelming as I thought it would be or you thought it would be. And um, yeah, internet, I'll see you next week.